It's okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here at Arama. I appreciate you guys coming. And uh, my name is Al Bello. I'm a sports photographer uh, for Getty Images. Um, and I've been uh, doing this more or less maybe the last 25 years, 26 years. And um, I think what I'm going to, before I show you some pictures, I'm going to give you an idea about what I'm about and how I shoot and what I'm thinking about. Um, I guess what I want to uh, bring forth to you guys is my style, uh, how I shoot. Um, not exactly textbook uh, sports photography. It's a little bit different. Um, when, I, when I look to see uh, what kind of photos I want, I uh, keep it fairly simple. And uh, to me, the, the more simple, the better. Um, just simple things like keeping a background clean, uh, figuring out where my light source is coming from, and simple composition is, uh, is my basic you know, jump off to when I'm taking sports photography pictures or regular pictures in general. Uh, I've broken down my show into a couple of categories and um, uh, I've got it uh, set for some underwater work that I've done, um, some of my Olympic type sports work. Uh, I've got a couple of picture stories I wanted to show you and just some other stuff that I do around town. And um, uh, yeah, so without wasting time, uh, underwater. Um, in order to do some underwater work, you, you should be uh, certified to scuba dive because um, it's very hard to get underwater and uh, hold your breath for any length of time. Um, so I recommend scuba diving. I've done 10 Olympics and uh, I've done underwater in most of them. So um, I kind of started with a bag, uh, just a little bag where you slip the camera in and held my breath. That's how I started doing sports photography, uh, underwater stuff. Um, uh, it's a great way to, to try it without spending a lot of money and uh, to figure out uh, how to see through the lens and deal with water. And water changes the game altogether when you're doing um, pictures. Uh, a, your camera can get ruined. Uh, you can't see the same way you see uh, through the viewfinder as you do outside the water. You gotta wear goggles. Uh, there's a whole breathing thing you gotta worry about. So uh, you gotta calm yourself down and think about what you're photographing, not just blindly shoot. Um, I started uh, with, with several different housings that I had uh, invented uh, with collaborations with other um, like mad scientists kind of uh, uh, developers of housings. Uh, and that's really what they are. These, these housing developers are kind of like mad scientists. They never have a straight answer for you. Something always doesn't work. Um, it's very hard to, to find somebody that you're happy with. And I've gone through several different housings, but this one particular is when, we, when I first started getting into it, in like around 1999, 2000, uh, I was able to pop a flash on my housing and put it in, into, the, uh, into the water. And what you have to do is you've got to uh, get under there before the event, uh, drop the camera down, visualize what you're going to see, and um, then let the swimmers go over you via a remote cable outside the pool. And as I go on, I'll show you some pictures of me working. It might give you a better idea. Um, but as you can see, a lot of this stuff has to do with reflections, uh, explosions, splashes in the water, and uh, a lot of bubbles. And, um, you know, when you you can work that really well when you have some of the best athletes in the world, like Michael Phelps. And I'll, I'll mention him a lot during this presentation. Um, there's a lot of failure in underwater uh, sports photography. A lot of the times, anything can go wrong. You can have a battery go dead. You can have a leak in your housing. Uh, these days, they make housings that you can run a cable to your computer and you can run it from outside the pool. If the connection goes bad, then you lose connection to your camera. During an event, you can't go, time out guys, uh, let me just jump in the pool and fix that. Um, so there's times where you just don't get anything out of it. Uh, focusing issues, um, 
a lot of things can go wrong. So it's a real tedious love-hate relationship I've got with, with doing underwater sports photography. It, takes, it consumes so much of your time and mental energy uh, that sometimes you forget uh, that you're trying to create pictures under there. Um, there's rare occasions where you can shoot them during practice, like this one, uh, practicing for an event where you can kind of swim around the pool. Uh, sometimes you get lucky and catch the sun behind the swimmer if you're in an outdoor event. Or if you're indoors, you know, happy accidents happen where you can get them half in and half out of the water. Um, you can set your camera up pretty much where you want underneath the pool. And um, uh, as long as it's, it's okay with the organizers, you know, they check on where you're putting your camera, you can do whatever you can get away with. Um, as, as well as swimming, goes for diving. It's a whole different world underwater. And that was part of the allure for me, because uh, I can be where the swimmers are and show you what things look like under the water. Because it's a whole different ball game when you see what's outside the pool. Uh, this is me in my gear getting handed my underwater camera. Uh, sometimes I'll occasionally do shoots uh, where I can control everything. Um, there's underwater lights and my subject and you can light the pool uh, your own way. So we have a lot of control. Uh, this is me at a low-key diving event in Florida, and I actually prefer these days to kind of be at these low-key events because I can, I can work on pictures that, that are in my head without having too much of a hassle with the organizing people. Um, as you can see, it's controlled chaos during the event, and my goal is... Um, in this particular uh, moment, I was trying to do a half-in, half-out photo from the diving board. So you can see me there. Um, to my right, there's a clamp uh, here. And I'm eventually going to clamp the camera to that, uh, to that clamp. And once it's set up, there's a cord attached. See it? It's attached to my body. And off-site, off I'll hit the control once I have the camera set up the way I want it. And I have to get out of the pool, and once competition starts, you do a picture like this. And uh, you time it, it's a remote control thing. There's some other stuff of me swimming around during practice. And uh, this is what I really enjoy doing. It's, uh, it's fun to try and create different images. Now this is the camera fully submerged. So instead of half in, half out, this is what, what it looks like under the water. Uh, this is at the Olympics. I believe it might be Beijing in 2008. But you can see you need some help getting handed your gear and all the cords that go with it. It's like an underwater highway under there, under the pool with all the other uh, photographers that put their cameras in the pool. But uh, if you get a ceiling like you do in Beijing, uh, the ceiling was phenomenal and uh, has a lot to do with uh, how you're going to position your camera. Uh, if you've got a very boring ceiling where it's not much to it, I tend to shoot more across the pool. But with a ceiling like this, um, you could really couldn't miss. Um, you can see it's just structured so beautiful. I should also say, if you've got a question, stop me. Because we got all day, honestly. I got 90 minutes here, so. Um, there's another view of the housing with all the, with all the cords and everything. You also got to weigh the camera down on a plate. And um, it's heavy. So otherwise the camera's going to pop up in the middle of the event. And that's not good either. Reflections are a big, big part of doing underwater photography uh, with swimming, uh, especially in competition. Um, the problem is, once the first few heats go, or the first few events go, the water gets all ripply. So you kind of want to get a shot like this before um, many of the events get going, 
because uh, once the heats go, it's just one after the other after the other. Um, you might want to wait till the finals when they have a break in between where the water s settles down. Um, um, and this is a part of the pool that was opposite all the other cameras. Uh, usually the whole strip at the bottom here is full of cameras and wires and all kinds of stuff. And I was thinking in my head, let me go to the opposite side uh, where it's more clean. And that's how I like to think anyway, like I said before. Uh, this is me using underwater strobes uh, that are set off by this cord. So the strobes are waterproof and they're in the, in the housing itself. They got its, its own self-contained housing and I'm setting off strobes underneath the pool and outside the pool as well. Um, you can see where the light source is from outside and the light source from the other way. So hopefully this gives you a better idea of what I'm trying to do. You know, and if you can get a situation like this where you match the light against a nice form of clouds, it's, uh, it's helpful makes the picture a lot better. This was a shoot I did for this goggle company, TYR. So it was totally in a control situation. Again, reflections. This is something I was doing for Speedo of Michael Phelps. Um, stole the bubbles and the dimensions underneath. Just adds to the picture. Uh, recently did this in my friend's backyard uh, last summer of a boxer. Uh, made a bubble machine uh, via, it was a uh, air compressor, and I cut some holes in a, a copper pipe, and capped it off, and ran the air underneath the water, and had the bubbles come up. And um, it was pretty fun. It was just a self-assignment that I was happy to do. And then we had him outside the water, throwing punches, just throwing punches as it splashed the water. This was early on in my uh, experimental days of doing um, underwater work. I pulled aside some of the swimmers and uh, one light outside the pool straight down and I was able to set the camera off and I had them blow bubbles for me and I had this girl do the same. This is a live event. I was able to get into the water with some of the athletes before an open water swimming event. Um, like I said, you got to visualize what you want. Uh, one of the lens companies was recently come out with a, this new circle lens, fisheye, and I've always wanted to try an underwater photo to get everyone in the same lane, uh, which I hadn't been able to do because the lens wasn't wide enough. So I visualized it, placed the camera how I wanted it, and we executed the shot and uh, came out exactly how I wanted, everybody in the same lane in a streamlined position. Uh, the housings have changed over the years, you know. How many, many attempts did you do to get that? Um, yeah, like I said, it, it is a lot of failure in doing these kind of pictures. And uh, it's the right stroke at the right time. Um, so I, I, I want to say a session, one full session. Um, and the swimmers break at a certain point of the pool. Uh, when I say break, that means break the, the water surface. So you have 15 meters to do it. This particular photo, I knew that if I got them as they dove in, they start to streamline, and if I miss them, they'll come up and go into their stroke. So I got it like halfway. I kind of figured out where they were diving in and where they streamlined. So there's a little thought that, that goes into it. Uh, and again, as I was saying, the housings have changed and I've changed and photography's changed and cameras change and you gotta always try and keep up. Um, so we're at the point now where the cameras are connected not just uh, to fire a remote, it's hooked into your computer, it's hooked into power that runs under the pool and outside the pool to, to where you're sitting, poolside, and you're able to work your computer, exposure, all kinds of stuff in live view, which is helpful in a lot of ways, but the downside is, um, again, if there's any connection issue or any little problem here or there, you kind of wash your hands of it for the session because you can't get in the pool to fix something if it doesn't work. So it's, a, again, a love-hate thing. You put a lot, a lot of time, hours and hours and 
travel and gear is so much, so heavy and everything. Um, but like I say, you know, the, the reward is good. Um, this is me setting up the housing underneath the water. You can see uh, we got sandbags and just trying to position the camera right. Uh, and you know, you can put the camera in a lot of different places. This just happened to be a race between Michael Phelps and um, uh, his arch rival from the US, name's escaping now. now. Um, Ryan Lochte, that's it, sorry, thank you very much. Ryan Lochte. Um, this was back at the Olympic trials before London. Uh, sometimes, again, a happy accident. This diver had just completed a dive and she was coming to the surface and the splash made a heart shape picture and a lot of people refer to this as the, the heart photo. Uh, uh, the real reason I was doing the picture from this angle was when the girls dive, the women, um, their bathing suits come down and you can't use the photo because the bathing suits come, come down and they pick them up very quickly. Uh, and the reason I had it off to the side was the bubbles would be able to cover any, anything that, that was showing. And luckily, she had already fixed her bathing suit and was coming up to the surface at this point. Um, using what the situation gives you is also pretty cool. Uh, in this case, all the, the outdoor lights uh, in the arena. I was able to, to work it into a nice silhouette with all the splashes. And, uh, and the same thing with the swimming photo. Um, you do the best you can with what, what is given to you, you know? Uh, one thing I've learned over the years is uh, you know, I've had, I've had real frustrating times and I've had real successful times and you gotta s somehow balance it in, in the middle. You know, you can't get too over the top when you get a really nice picture and you can't get too low when things don't go right for you. Uh, and I still struggle to this day when, when I'm having a bad day. Um, and I think that goes for everyone who's uh, interested in photography, you know. If things aren't working out for you, uh, it's just hard to get over. Um, this is a synchronized swimming start picture. And what's cool about synchronized swimming in the sport, it doesn't really turn me on. Um, to be honest, it's kind of uh, boring if you're just sitting there photographing them. Um, but underwater, it's, it's, it's really cool uh, because there's a bunch of swimmers involved. You can deal with a lot of different uh, entries into the pool and you can shoot it from right underneath them. Or in this case, I did this a few weeks ago. I was in Canada. And uh, again, it was a low-key event. Um, they call it the Pan American Games. So it's not exactly an Olympics. It's an Olympic-style uh, sport, uh, sporting thing. But it's not as intense. There's less photographers there. And uh, I knew that I would have a uh, cleaner pool to work in. And what I mean by that is that not so many photographers would be there uh, uh, shooting. So I had a clean floor. And television wasn't so hell-bent on putting all their cameras and remotes in there as well. So I was, I was happy to, to work out this photo. Uh, what I didn't tell you was that day I, uh, I broke my primary camera um, because the, the uh, connection became uh, loose and I wasn't able to connect uh, my secondary camera uh, housing that I was trying to hurry up now and get into the pool. I, I pulled the camera itself too hard and I pulled one of the pieces off the housing. So I made a hole in the, in the housing. So that's not good when you want to put it underwater. You know what I mean? So I'm sitting there with a ton of gear around me and I'm, I'm just like, things can't get any worse. Uh, but luckily I remembered I had some replacement parts, right? And that's where preparation helps you out a lot. And uh, they say, I learned from a friend of mine that I worked with a long time ago, they call it the six P's, proper preparation prevents piss poor performance. So say that to myself slowly every time I go to a big event where I know I'm gonna have to pack a lot of stuff. Luckily in my little trinket case, I had not the exact replacement piece, but one where I was able to shove the thing in and screw the thing and I, I made it watertight and I was able to get my second camera back again. Thank goodness. And I, we got this photo out of it. Uh, Again, uh, you want to state where you are sometimes. Here is Beijing 2008, so let people know where you're going. Ceiling, again, you can't miss with the ceiling, honeycomb, and they, they called it the water cube. It was a tremendous building that China put together for this event. Uh, and then this is a contrast. This is an outdoor event. 
and you're working the sun into your picture. Uh, not an easy thing, it's tricky with the sun, you gotta expose it right. And back then, at this particular event, we weren't using uh, housing that has uh, the capabilities to see on the computer in live view. So it was kind of a lot of guesswork. Um, simpler in some ways, harder in other ways. Uh, again, using lights to your advantage. Um, this is a different event where now the light is now, for some reason the pool had a really good kickback on the sun, so it kicked back all the reflection. Uh, so the sun it almost acted like its own reflector, so it would come through, you have to time the right time of day, to so set up your camera to let the sun bounce off the bottom of the pool and come back up into the swimmer. So this is during the day, early, and then totally different picture, same event, same angle, in the afternoon. Now the sun's gone, and so now you're thinking, what do I do now? I don't want to wash out the, the pool. Okay, I'll work on a silhouette picture. So you go from one extreme to the other. You have to adapt with whatever the light source is giving you. Um, these are not set up pictures, so you got to these are during competition, so you can't play around like you, like you want to. Um, but you just got to adapt. This was also a few weeks ago in Canada at the Pan Am Games. I got out into the water during competition, and um, it was the open, wa open water event where the swimmers swim around the lake or the ocean, whatever it may be. This happened to be a lake. But I wanted to show you what it's like in the elements. And uh, I want to tell you, probably shot the sequence of the swimmers going by and I thought for sure I had nothing uh, because it was, it was just a washing machine of swimmers going by. And it's a matter of me getting out there, getting the flippers on, swimming out there to where the swimmers are by the buoy, getting, uh, it took me day, actually st I started getting permission to do this maybe six months before the event. Asking, 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 come on, can you help me? I need to get out there, this is the reason why. This is what I've done in past events up to two days before, did you put it in writing? Yeah, I asked you six months ago. Yeah, I asked you three months ago. Yeah, I asked you two months ago. I asked you last week. Uh, yeah, we need it in writing. Uh, so, fill out the letter again, ask request. So, it's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that goes on into getting access. And access is everything, everything in sports photography. You wanna be in there. I didn't wanna be on the dock far away. I wanted to be in there with the swimmers. I wanted to be in there, I wanted to show them the elements. And when it was all said and done, I still thought I blew the picture because they came by so quick and I was trying to keep up with them and they're professional swimmers and I'm not. And I, even though I had my flippers on, I was trying to follow them along, follow them along. And I wanted to get the half in, half out. But I swear I went back and I was looking through and it was just all water and nothing. And, nothing. and then all of a sudden one picture came and it was this one. And I was, couldn't tell you how happy I was uh, just to at least get something out of it. Uh, and then the next day, oh no, later that afternoon I went back, so it went from a cloudy, um, overcast day to now opposite later in the day. They had the second race of the day, and I saw this bridge, and I just thought, okay, different picture. I want to get over there, and I swam over there, and uh, everything from the morning was now forgotten for the afternoon. There's a whole different crew, and I had to go through the whole thing again. Yes, I've been cleared to go. Yes, I'm a photographer. Yes, I'm here. I'm in the pool, and I'm in the water, and I'm flipping around and I've got my camera and my flippers and my goggles on. And a police officer swims out to me on his jet ski and, uh, and he stops over and he doesn't really say anything. And I'm looking at him, I'm like, hey officer. And he goes, hey, he says, what are you doing there? And I have my housing camera and I went, well, I'm a photographer, I'm taking pictures here. And he goes, uh, yeah, you got any ID, son? And I went, <laughs> and I went, oh. It's gonna be one of these days. And I went, uh, what do you mean? He goes, just what I said, you got any ID on you? And I went, well, you know, and I'm, all, I'm like this, and I'm just trying to breathe and talk at the same time. And I go, well, no, not, not really, officer. It's back at the press room. And he goes, well, how do I know you didn't just jump in the water? And I go, well, again, I've been credentialed. I got a little, a little, a little, a whole thing. Just then, a lifeguard who had seen me from the morning, she swims over on a paddleboard and she goes, officer, He's all right, you know, he was with us this morning and, and then the officer kind of calmed down and said, you'll vouch for him? Yeah, yeah, vouch for him. And then I didn't see him again. He just was busting balls. I don't know what the problem was with him is, but you go through things like that. Sometimes the pictures don't tell you that. I like to tell you behind the scenes stuff of how you get to where you gotta go to get what you want. Um, oh, this is another one from a few weeks ago that uh, I've always wanted to try, but I never had the access to do. 
and that's uh, do a half in, half out of a diving competition uh, from underneath the 10 meter board. Now, it's been in my head for the longest time to try and do this, uh, but the events I'm going to, whether it be uh, aquatic world championships, Olympic events, um, there's no way in hell they're gonna let you drop a camera and clamp it um, half in, half out, right on the 10 meter board. There's just no way. Uh, you know, and they'll give you every reason. No, you're gonna be in TV's way. Uh, it's gonna hurt the swimmers. Um, all this other stuff, and I, I just, thought, all right, I'm at this event, it's kind of low key, I'm gonna try again. And um, I got a lot of people involved, a lot of the photo managers and um, the underwater technician that was there and showed them exactly what I wanted to do. And there was this helper bar, like a bar to help them get out of the steps. And you see it in pools, you know, it's just like, it's, it's a bar like that. And I thought if I clamped it right, on, right on, under there, the way I showed you in that Florida event, uh, I could set it up and nobody would be in, there would be no problems. And um, again, I started this process a long time ago and I was trying to plant the seed in the head. And they went for it. I mean, you know, you, you can beat on the door so many times and finally somebody's gonna open the door. But um, I guess what I can tell you guys is you won't get anything unless you ask for it. Nobody's gonna give you anything. You gotta go get it. And um, Aside from that, now that I got my permission, I had to get the picture I wanted. And um, you know, you ask me how many times it took to, to get this picture, a lot. I shot a ton of frames as the divers just jumped in the water. And uh, we got one. And I was a little concerned about the water splashing on the part of the housing that was showing, but it turned out that it kind of added to the picture with all the little splash marks. Um, so again, um, I do a lot of Olympics. I've done a, I've done a few of them, and uh, uh, I got some pictures split up between the summer and the and the winter games. Um, as I told you before, I kind of like to be off on my own a lot, um, not around where the other photographers are, and I uh, I tend to thrive in that situation a lot better. Um, uh, most of the time, I don't have that luxury. I'm tied in with everyone else, and. Uh, uh, this was like day 16 of the Olympics. I can't remember which one, but it wears you out. It's a, a lot of hours and um, a lot of lugging around gear. It's very physical and um, you, you're pretty beat up by the end. But still, if you're in this situation with all these photographers, you've got to think, how am I going to outdo these guys that I'm sitting right next to that have the same lenses as me, the same position? You've got to just try and think how else you're going to outdo the other photographers. So. There's a couple of ways. Again, background, composition, where is your light source coming from? Those are the three things that just drives me anytime I go do something, uh, regardless of what it is. I mean, it could be um, trying to photograph my son and daughter you know, on vacation, or it could be photographing Michael Phelps at the Olympics. And, oh, by the way, how am I gonna outdo everyone? Let me try and shoot this at 15th of a second and see what happens, you know? And so, that kind of thought process will eventually raise you some success if you practice enough. And um, you know, this was one of those things that really worked. And when you're doing a slow, uh, a slow speed picture, uh, you really need something sharp, particularly the eyes. And um, you'll have a, a ton more failure than you will success, but there's one that succeeds. It's usually a pretty special picture. So um, we got this one out of uh, the Olympics in Athens. Um, again, angles are real important in sports photography. This was at the top of the stadium in Beijing, and I knew it was uh, decathlete day, and they were doing the long jump portion. Now, decathletes are, are, are good at a, a lot of things, but not great at one thing. So, um, uh, you know, while they, they, they can compete in all these 10 events that they do, uh, there's bound to be some slip ups, and this guy happened to just step wrong and he fell and he went head over heels and he fell right on his face and I just happened to be you know framed perfectly with a clean background and he dragged the sand with him and made an indent um, but I wouldn't have had that from the floor you know and everyone wants to be on the field everyone wants to be on the sideline I'm the kind of guy who'll go fine put me upstairs I'll do the best I can with it this was one of those days where I said in my mind I was thinking right the Catalan, they're not that good at doing it as the other guys are uh, they're doing the long jump. Let me go upstairs and see if somebody falls or does something 
you know, out of the ordinary. And sure as, sure as heck, this is what happened. This guy fell like that. Um, this is interesting because you see it's a triangle of light, right? Late day, I was on the track. Again, I was upstairs. This little piece of light, the, you know, the stadium, the sun was setting, and so it was making these shadows on the field. This little triangle of light was moving around, around and around and around, and slowly it went onto the track where the men's 10,000 was being uh, taken place. And I, I just thought, I'll follow this light. So I was able to follow it for the men's 10,000, and then it also went, moved a little more to the men's high jump. So you're able within 10 minutes to get two pretty cool pictures in two different settings uh, all at once. And that usually doesn't happen, something like that. So I was pretty psyched about that. Again, I'm in the roof in Sydney years ago, maybe 2000, I was doing the balancing beam. Uh, the girls were all performing, and I thought to myself, one of these girls is gonna fall. And sure, sure enough, this girl fell, but she, I thought they would fall on the floor. She just held on for dear life. Um, but from the floor, it would have been a different picture altogether. The background would have been probably not so good with all the uh, referees and judges and everybody else in the stands. Um, so take that for what it's worth. When you're at the Olympics, there's tons of emotion, whether it's cheering and, or victory or sadness. That is something that happens every single day at every single event. There's a final every day. Um, somebody's winning a gold medal and you're surrounded by it. So be ready for joy, for sadness, uh, for intensity. You know, guys are giving it up left and right or they're being sad. But you should be ready for that. And just know that when it happens, you need to be in the right spot. Um, detail shots, crying, uh, jubilation. It's all part of the Olympics and you need to get all that stuff. You know, these are finish line pictures at the end of the race. You know, these people are exhausted um, and uh, sometimes painful to photograph because these people are in real pain at the end of a big race. Um, this was a few weeks ago. Again, um, I put myself slightly, slightly above where I wanted to be. Uh, and it was another thing arguing with the security guards. He didn't want me there. It's a fire hazard. I said, yeah, okay, I'll leave. I came back later on. Turned out to be, uh, this was a gold medal match. Um, if I was on the field, uh, I knew I would have been blocked by the first base coach. And also the, the background wasn't, wasn't very good at all. Um, above this blue Chevrolet sign was horrendous poles and netting and dug out and all kinds of stuff that I wasn't really happy with. So I was able to clean up the background just enough and the uh, picture all came together at the end. Um, guy scored the winning run. Helmets flying, sad guy, happy guy, and all in one picture. Moments, you know what I mean? That's what sports photography is. Same thing with this, big lift. The big guy lifting for his country of Greece. He made the big lift. Where are you? It says it right there. Olympics, Athens. All in one. Remote pictures, again, you know, it's, uh, you put yourself where you can't be. There's no way I could have laid under this jump without the horse trampling me or injuring myself and everyone else. So you put a remote camera there and uh, you move away and you fire it via remote, uh, via radio signal or hardwire. Um, uh, this is just me uh, um, working colors into a photo. You know, I, I like to work where I el eliminate a lot of colors. Um, by that I mean now you look at this picture, it's all the, the lines are correct. He's got blue on, the ropes are blue, and it's just a black background. So basically there's like three colors there. It's like his skin color, the blue, and the black. Um, it kind of makes things simple, but everything works. The lines all go together, squared up, lights, and he just happened to look down just before the round started. I just stuck the camera underneath and worked it out. Uh, lighting, where is the light? It's coming from behind now. So, uh, splash of water in the back, Little silhouette, just a nice picture to go before morning training. Uh, this is a strange event they held during the Asian Games. CPAC Tak Raw, that's what it's called. It's like volleyball with your feet. Um, no, it doesn't have to be during competition. It's just, just when it's getting going. A little celebration as the light goes. 
overhead, wrestling, clean of background, shadow, horse, jumper. Um, you just gotta look around where, where your surroundings are. And here I'm, at, I'm in the roof of one of the buildings shooting a synchro event, oh. or I'm putting a remote in at a uh, gymnastics event. This is me working in Tiananmen Square before the, uh, before the start of the Olympics. Uh, drew a crowd, but this is kind of what we're doing. We're taking the picture and transmitting it on site. And we're shooting uh, the fireworks at the end. Some more stuff. This is a remote picture from the 100 meter final. This is called the Bird's Nest. They're actually having the World Championships there now this week. Uh, but this is when Usain Bolt broke out. This is when he started making his name. Wanted to give like a pullback version of uh, where you are, setting, sense of place. Torrential rainstorm started during one of the days of the Olympics and you take advantage of it when you can. Um, it just made a, a deluge and it just happened to have to run the race anyway, but you make the best of it. Uh, getting your surroundings, palm trees, or a horse jump with uh, um, Greek symbols. You can use the Olymp Olympic flame in the background sometimes. Or again, slow down the shutter speed just to make a not so exciting sport more exciting, at least to the eye. Sometimes I'll put a remote in the steeplechase at the athletics events. And it's always fun for me to shoot steeple steeplechase because they're jumping over water and uh, it's pretty dynamic. Uh, it's a fun event to shoot. And there's all different lighting situations you can use just depending on where the sun is. Sometimes I put it like right underneath. This was here in Manhattan, Randall's Island. Uh, long jump, you could pan, slow speed, and you just pan along with them. But the same guy jumping as up with my handheld, I'm also shooting him on a remote camera that I had already set underneath the jump. So I'm getting two pictures in one, or three pictures in one. Um, so that you can see my remote by the number five and then I put another one on the opposite side to shoot one, two, three pictures, one shot. Not too bad when they all work out. Again, take advantage of some lighting against the light. Training picture, you know, sometimes you, you're assigned to shoot some training, a little window lit scene coming through. Or you gotta pay attention to swimmers when they, uh, when they set up, everybody's got a tick. They all do some kind of things. Some put waters in their mouth and spit it out. This guy. I knew we'd do it every time, and I just had to get the background right. It took a few, few years to follow this guy, but got it finally. Uh, slow, speed uh, slow speed pan again, get the swirl of water, or a reflection. Again, first heat of the finals is when the water is flat. So a guy like Michael Phelps, he's going to swim in the final. You want to make sure it's water's flat, get yourself in position, and uh, shoot the picture. Um, we just happen to get to know each other over the years, so we've had a couple Olympics together, um, and he's always been a pleasure. He's laughing at his picture on his credential. Um, but it helps you get close to him with him being comfortable uh, as you go. Um, you know, there's all kinds of moments at the Olympics. Uh, he's kind of a special guy to photograph. He's really something. Um, but angles, again, you know, you just want to work angles out. Try and get in there sometimes as close as you can. You don't need, always need to sit back over the long lens to photograph uh, these things. Um, backgrounds, lighting, piece of sun. And divers are, are notorious for making strange faces when they're spinning around 100 miles an hour. But one thing I, liked, I definitely like to do is, is uh, follow the sun. I'm a big fan of late, late day lighting, deep shadows. Um, it just, it's just the texture. And it's just the way it looks that really gets me going. Uh, slow slope, uh, speed pan. You know, it's a messy background and you try and blend it all in. So you slow it down to maybe eighth of a second and you just follow the swimmers down as they go. You gotta get the right dive as well. You can't get them when they're doing spinny dives. You gotta just get them when they're going down. And it's like one dive. Uh, you get five or six dives, but there's one where they just kind of drop off and fall backwards. That's the one where you have to follow them. 
Same thing here. Or here is more of an impression, you know, when they jump off the board and then start their spin. Uh, you can slow it down even more, like a quarter of a second, and see what you get. This one just happened to work. Um, again, I'm just a big fan of trying different things. This is a remote, app, remote picture I put in the, uh, in the top of the um, diving board on a 10 meter. And then this is one I did two weeks ago. Again, it was a process of <clears throat> uh, working on the organizers months ahead of time, uh, explaining what I wanted to do. And in order to explain what I had to do, I wanted to show them what I had done already. So they go, that's never been done before. And I go, yeah, let me show you. I, I did this in Florida or whatever. You know? So once they see that it's been done, you, know, you got to clear it with television. And even after I cleared this with television, uh, one round into the dive, they sent somebody up to shut my camera off. And when I was like, you know, I was like, I was like hey guys, what'd you do that for? He said, well, it was too close to the microphone, so the camera was, was uh, making too much noise for TV. Um, I did get around in and I got the picture I wanted, but, uh, you know, the best laid plans always go to hell when it's all said and done. Um, but luckily we got one in. And the difference between this one and this one is, uh, outdoors and obviously indoors, I wanted a little more texture to, to a photo, you know, where it's not fluffy clouds and a beautiful sky. I wanted this one to be, right, we're in competition, we're in a stadium, it's all happening, and, um, and the ceiling just happened to be helpful with all the layers that they had up in the, in the ceiling. Um, another setting that's beautiful to do diving is in Barcelona, and uh, uh, they've been building this church for hundreds of years. I don't know when they're gonna get done with it, but it's always the background, um, and you can't miss with this background and uh, every time you go there to do a diving event. Um, it helps to get up early in the morning, you know. Uh, uh, being lazy in this business is really not par for the course. Um, you work endless hours, uh, and anyone who does sports photography will, will let you know, or photography in general. It's, it's, it's a job that is ongoing, and you are working all hours of the day, and it's best early morning, late day, it's when the sun is at its best. You know, again, you work it in, Nice background, clear, red colors. Um, real helpful to doing sports photography. Little details like, um, you know, this, this athlete with long nails, Gail Devers. Uh, you know, try and put remotes wherever you can. This is right under the starting block uh, on the backstroke. I, I shoved the camera in there, uh, again, a few weeks ago in Canada. Or I went into the ceiling, you know, and again, the swimmers make funny faces as they break the surface. Um, they call this the bubble picture, you know, and I'm not the first, I won't be the last, but it's always fun to try to do that. Again, you got to time it on the right stroke, and they break the surface at a certain point. And every swim is different, so you just got to follow them along and know when they're going to pop up. And as they pop up is when you fire off your frames. Um, having a, a housing is advantageous to me because I can be in the water and a lot of the other photographers are not in the water. So it gives me a, a, an angle that not everybody has. So uh, in preparation for a big swim, this guy was splashing his face and I kind of paddled over with my swimmies and I was able to fire off a few frames before the race as they prepare and then when they dive in. So, you know, all within a matter of a few minutes, you just nail in a couple of shots that you would never be able to do off the side of the dock. So. Um, this is why I like to, to try and get right in there. Uh, I'm always a sucker for a sunset. This just happened to be a beautiful sky. You just got to recognize it and then get off, get off your feet and go move around. And I'm a big fan of moving around, especially when I got freedom to do so. Um, win or loser, you know, you just try and work that into a picture. Um, I never did water skiing before. It was my first time trying this a few weeks back. Again, it's just basic. I got myself on the boat. Uh, the follow boat, and I was able to put, 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 get the driver to stop in front of this little patch of trees where it's clean, and the guy did a trick. So, you know, a little luck, a little preparation. So you meet them somewhere in the middle, and when your time comes, you take the picture. Uh, hands are huge in volleyball. Everybody's always blocking everybody's shot. It's just a matter of just thinking how you want to do the picture. Um, you know, synchronized diving, two bullets. Um, this is me and uh, a very uh, fa uh, famous photographer in the sports world, his name's Heinz Klubmeier. Um, uh, we were setting up a remote for a start picture at the Olympics, and again, like I said, you always gotta clear it with everybody and the photo manager and everyone else, and uh, 
this, this nice guy was real helpful in, in helping us get our shot there. But it turns out, you know, you can get a shot like this, so you can be right next to the swimmers before. And again, the whole reason was this, this water cube was amazing. And then jumping in the water. Or setting up a start picture away from you. And you could see the splashes go back on the, on the lens, and it kind of adds a little something to it. Um, uh, quiet moments before the start of a race. You want to be akin to that. A uh, little bit of elevation, knock out the knock out the background a little bit so you can focus more on your subject. Um, blue sky, fisheye lens, corner moments during uh, Olympics. The guys wear helmets, or they did until recently, and so the punches never really look good when, you, when you're doing the punch picture. So I like to do more of the corner stuff. Again, a slow, slow shutter speed, maybe about an eighth. And um, a lot of failure, but a couple that work, you know? And a guy would get splashed and he would squirt the water out of his mouth. Again, this is diving using your elements, which is the blue sky. Or again, six in the morning, and you just sandwich that sun right in between this diver. Ping pong, it's a tough sport to make look good. Uh, again, a remote, I shoved the camera in the bushes so nobody would really see it, and the horse was unaware of it, so you just gotta get clearance and, and execute. Uh, the winter, is totally different than the summer. Obviously, the elements, you're in the snow a lot of the time. Now, while not all the sports are in, in, in the snow, I, I tend to gravitate more to, to the snow because I like to be out there and I'm able to move around a little more. Um, you know, and there's all kinds of stuff, bobsled, skeleton, luge, and again, you notice that Kind of the same styles with all these pictures. Clean background, good composition, lighting, execution. Uh, even if you're shooting a crash, you know, stay on it. If you're panning, you might get lucky. Um, it's big celebration is no different in the winter than it is in the summer. If you can get a bob coming through just before it hits the shadows, or you can work the fans into the picture, or you can use that fisheye lens that I just showed you, that other swimming picture. When you're out there, you can move around. It's a huge track. When you're at ski jump, it's the same thing. Go up and down the steps, work the crowd in, wide, tight, remotes. Bring them all out. Uh, this is us underneath the lip of the jump at the ski jump. So if you ever watch on TV, the guys go down, poof, and they take off at the bottom of the jump. So here we are. We're able, at the, for this particular Olympics, we were able to get under the jump. But I got there real early, so I was right underneath the guy. Anyone to my left or right was a slight angle, but I, was, I made sure I was there early, and I was able to get exactly in the middle. So um, I can't tell you how many blank frames I got, or half skis, or they go by so fast, it's, it's ridiculous how fast they are. But sometimes they don't let, this past Olympics, they didn't let you underneath the lip, so you gotta set up a remote. So that's me setting up a remote. And I'm over there on that side shooting while the remote's firing, them going over the snow-capped mountains. Uh, if I get bored and I want to get away from it, I go into the trees you know, and work myself into the wilderness and find a little hole to shoot through. Want to pick something with a uh, bright, you know, like this little red guy who's jumping. You know, he stands out. If it was a gray guy or a white guy, it wouldn't show as much. Again, panning, you know, here's me as a long lens as they just about go to the jump. It's a little more industrial, a little more futuristic, but um, it's just you're constantly thinking, of what else can I do different? What can I do different? It's just to put me over here and everyone else is here, you know what I mean? Uh, go to the bottom of the mountain, late day sun, long shadows. Again, a pan from the other jump. There's two jumps. There's a K120 and there's a K90. I went to the other side and I got myself away from everybody and just panned away. Uh, sometimes you use the lights, they jumped at night this past Olympics. This is a remote picture at the gold medal match. Uh, the team won the gold medal. This is a remote from behind the net, and the puck just happened to hit the glass at the right time. Um, the skating, you use the TV lighting to your advantage. Or put a remote with the rings just to give you a sense of where you are. Or again, shooting through trees or any other thing to try and um, just change the picture a little bit. Overhead, long shadows, big fan of it. Compression with the long lens, all the colors. 
uh, or the sun can go in and turn into a torrential uh, snowstorm. You just gotta be able to adapt. Uh, this is a, a turn during one of the cross country events. I ran to the top of the ski jump, shot the cross country turn, ran downstairs all the way around, around the stands and back up again. And I was able to get to the finish line in time for the finish. So, you know, if you hustle, you can get a couple of pictures in one race. Um, this was ski slope. Uh, it's a rather newer event at the Olympics, but it was fun to do. My camera fell in the snow, so it was all full of snow and I didn't notice it till afterwards. Happy accident, I'll take it. Uh, crashes galore, they're always falling at these events. So you just want to be ready for that. Little moments while they're waiting for their scores at the finish line. Boy, again, you're using the elements, snow-capped mountains, late day sun. Uh, and then you get into ski photography, which is on top of winter sports, it's yet another ball game because you're now in there with the skiers skiing on their mountain, the same mountain that they ski, trying to find a spot to pull over to shoot the picture. And so you're wearing a big ton of gear, 50, 60 pounds, and you've got to ski the same mountain as the, as the Olympic skiers. So it's, it's no easy task, but um, you do it. You know, and I, I can't say I'm an expert skier, I'm, you know, I'm pretty mediocre, but uh, you, know, you just hold your breath and you just, the first couple times I did it, was, it's harrowing, and still is. I just did it in February. And there's some days where it's just ice you're skiing on and man, just got to be careful. Uh, but again, risk, no risk, no reward. So uh, skiing, ski photography is again, a matter of clean backgrounds, where they're going to turn. You got you to gotta really kind of figure it out like a race car, like a racetrack. And you got to look up and find the lines where the ski is going to go, ask questions. I am by no means an expert at doing this stuff. Uh, so I'll ask a ton of questions. Anybody who follows a circuit, you know, they'll help you out more times than not. Uh, but it just comes down to the same things I tell you all the time. I'll tell anybody, background, light, composition. I'll say it to the day I die. Simple things like that just get you where you gotta go. If you look and you go, yeah, there's a judge in the way, I don't like it here. Make yourself move and go if you can. Sometimes you can't, you know. You have to be in position an hour before and then you, you're screwed, you know, you can't move. Once you go there and a ski patrol comes by and goes, that's good or that's bad, you want them to say that's good because if they say that's bad, you've got like five minutes to go find another position on top of the whole mountain that you just skied. So uh, you better make sure your position is pretty good. Um, again, panning, you know, uh, find a fairly clean background, pan against a black background, or you can go into silhouette mode, you know, and find a jump where you got your jump here, but over there, the sun's hitting them backlit, and I can get two pictures in one. So I've done that many times, you know, in different situations. You know, where you got a picture like that, and go, oh yeah, you know what, the jump above, the trees are just making this little, nice, funny little shadow. So, you know, it's just, it, what may, it's what gets me going. You know, again, I'm not the kind of guy who'll sit on first base on the baseball game all the time. Uh, it is part of my job, and I'm not knocking it, um, but it's not what, at this point in my career, it doesn't, get me excited like doing stuff like this. Um, I like moving around, I like seeing different lighting situations, I like being challenged. Um, so uh, uh, I'll go where they tell me sometimes because I have to be there, be it a World Series or whatever else. And not, I'll tell you what, 90% of my job, 90% is a lot of um, standard stuff, you know, where you gotta get the swing, you gotta get the catch, you gotta get whatever, you know, a coach hugging the player. But that's that 10% that still drives me in, in, this, in this business. It's that 10% of being able to figure out pictures in my head and working them out and then putting them through my hands into the camera and out um, is what gets me going, you know? Um, you know, even able to get into a TV tower on the last day of this event, uh, the challenge of just doing that and getting that done got me more excited than being there the whole two weeks at the World Ski Championships because I was able to get where I wanted to go and was able to execute. Um, again, access is everything. Uh, you know, you can see pictures along the way. Uh, this just happened last year, you know, and I, uh, I'm not sure if you know this guy, Odell Beckham, who plays for the New York Giants, and he made a pretty spectacular catch at a very ordinary game in November uh, at night. It was in front of the national audience, and... Uh, um, um, they were at the 50, Eli Mann, and I positioned myself in the end zone, so that's me. 
in the corner. And that's usually where I like to go when they get closer to the end zone. The reason I like to be there is uh, Giant Stadium, Jet Stadium, uh, MetLife Stadium is, is not a very photographic stadium, uh, to pleasing to the eye. And the reason I say that is it's one of the messiest background stadiums I've ever been to. There's a huge scoreboard that going on either side of the stadium and uh, it couldn't be worse. It's very, very difficult to get a, a clean subject um, without getting part of the scoreboard or uh, they, they, and they, there's so many people that don't need to be there that are there and they're just standing there like this with um, these yellow jackets and you know I know the security but can't they be off to the side somewhere or coaches or players friends or mothers and sons and they're all there and it makes it very frustrating to photograph so if you notice to either side of me there's a mess of people the only background to me in that stadium is right there in that corner and I know it'll at least be semi-clean and I'm able to work a picture out um, that that's uh, that's pleasing to me and hopefully pleasing to you guys but the reason I'm dr drawing this all up is uh, I've been doing this 25 26 years and uh, never really had an opportunity like this in my life uh, where it all came together at once and I saw it happening slowly and developing slowly although it happened very quickly you know they say uh, w when you're focused and it's and you've done so many times it just becomes second nature and that was one of those times so Eli threw the ball I saw the corner of my eye they were running down the field I had a long lens and I switched to a shorter lens so it's, it's like second nature to me. So I'm ready. I've got a, a medium focal length zoom. Um, and I'm on him. And all I could think of is just stay with it, stay with it, stay with it. Catch the ball, take the picture. And it all happened in front of me. And I just did a series of Beckham catching this ball. Um, that's the frame a lot of people use, but nobody's ever asked me to show them the sequence. I figured I'd show them. This is what happened. So, one, two, three, four, five. I cut out a few frames, but I mean, more, you can see what I'm saying. The difference now is more crowd, less distractions, more focus on what's happening in front of me. Um, luck has a ton, a ton to do with sports photography, a ton. But you want to kind of make your own luck. You want to put yourself in the position to get the photo that you want. A lot of times it doesn't happen, um, but you want to be ready. So. This is one time where I put myself in a position, I wanted uh, this catch to happen or something similar, and it actually happened, and I was ready for it. And we got it out fast, and it, it, you know, and it was a lot of versions of this picture uh, from all different sides of the field. Um, and I'm not saying mine was the best, but I was pretty happy with this one. Um, so uh, there you go. Uh, perseverance, I guess you can say. Uh, some stories I want to show you. This was one I did a few years back. I was covering baseball, the World Baseball Classic down in Puerto Rico, and I would go back and forth to the games every day. And I noticed this circular stadium, and it just said uh, cockfighting. And then it said it in, in Spanish as well. And uh, I was just like, cockfighting, huh. And um, I pass it, and I go back to my hotel. I pass it, I come back to the hotel. I went scuba diving one day, I had the day off. Um, I got back to the room and I thought, oh, you know what, I got the day off. Let me just go in there and see what this is all about. Brought a couple of cameras. And a whole different world opened up my eyes and I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. Um, so it turned into this. I wound up photographing the farm where they train the cockfighter, uh, where they train the birds. And it's almost like boxing. It's a lot like boxing. You know, they have a trainer. Um, they have to make weight. They spar, uh, they spar the birds, and they wear pads on their, on their feet so they don't hurt themselves. Um, but these birds are, are brought up to fight. And they, they trim the birds' wings a certain way, they, they cut the little neck off uh, to make them more aerodynamic so they, their balance stays. So they cut the top and the, and the bottom off. It's, it's not pretty, but it's, it's what I, I noticed when I was there and I went back 
few times. Once during the baseball, and then I went back again. They size up the birds before the fights. It's all kind of gambling types there. A lot of money changes hands. They put the spikes on the bird. They drop them down. Two glass cages separate them. And they raise the cage, and then they just fight. And uh, more times than not, till the death. There's tons of money uh, exchanging hands. During the matches, they'll just bet hundreds and sometimes thousands of dollars on these birds fighting. And they're vicious, they're vicious fights. They're fighting for their lives, um, like that movie Gladiators almost. Um, it gets pretty brutal. So, it bothers me to this day, still showing this stuff, looking at it now. It's like it was yesterday, I was there. And then afterwards, they just, I don't know what the needles are for. Um, vitamins, they said. I asked them, I was like, what is that? And they said, vitamins. I, I don't know exactly what that means, but vitamins. The birds that lose get discarded. This one, this bird happened to be blind after the fight. They just left him in the garbage. And a little boy picked him up to, I don't know, to, I don't know what he was going to do with him, but he walked away with him. Uh, another thing I've been intrigued with uh, my whole life has been boxing. Um, not that I fight, I don't really, uh, but I've just been in awe of boxers my whole life from when I was a kid. Um, and uh, it was always, uh, always took notice of their faces, you know, and stories that are told on boxers' faces, be it scars or eyebrows or just cuts and swollen and um, there's so much pain involved in boxing and you only see Floyd Mayweather making millions of dollars. There's so many untold stories of guys fighting for chump change, you know, hundred, a couple hundred dollars. And um, I thought it would be a good project for me to, uh, when Polaroid was still in business, uh, they had this film, it was called Type 55, and it was a positive negative film and you'd uh, shoot one slide on a four by five camera take the picture, you're able to separate it into a negative and a, a Polaroid. So the negative is what you wanted to keep because that is what, you know, makes a big, nice quality picture. Um, and then, you know, you save the Polaroid for, for whatever. But um, I thought it would be cool to photograph boxers from when they were kids all the way up to maybe in their 80s, you know, when they're long retired. So um, this is a, almost an innocence thing where you can watch boxers grow up uh, before your eyes, you know, you get a kid who's like eight or nine years old, um, a little unsure of himself, but still trying to be tough guys. A little older, 11, 12, a little bit more sure of himself. And then maybe I get a couple of young amateurs. And if I went around, you know, any job I was doing, I'd, I'd try and squeeze in these little projects. So it was about six months maybe of work. Just, uh, you could see them growing now and getting a little bit more into their, into themselves and still unscarred though. You know, still a young career. And as you go now, you see little things. Bump on the nose, marks on their eyes. And these are champions now. This guy was a champion. These are all champions. Um, so, so that's uh, Jermaine Taylor. Uh, Diego Corrales. I mean, I don't know if you know any of these guys. They're all really good champions. This is Bernard Hopkins, the executioner. Uh, but they all have different looks, all different types of people. This famous woman boxer, Christy Martin. Uh, the late great Arturo Gatti, I mean, he thrilled fans for years, especially in Atlantic City in his last 10 fights, maybe. What a great guy to photograph. He had a face. Vinny Pazienza, you see his nose isn't exactly straight. You know, we're into post careers now. This is Mike Tyson. So this is kind of the setup. I wanted to show you this is the four by five camera. So you really just go, you have one shot at it. It's like click, and then you have to focus. It's upside down. The fighter can't move back and forth. You just gotta stand still, and you just get one shot at it. And I managed to get three frames off before they pulled them away for training. But, you know, that's one of the frames out of it that came. Uh, now we're past boxing days. A guy named Iran Barkley. He's had his wars in the past, and his eye's not quite right anymore. Uh, Vito Antifermo from the 70s, great Italian boxer, fought at the Garden many times, but wore uh, 
wore, wore his face uh, as his defense. He, he, he didn't have much of a defense. He used his face a lot. Um, Chuck Wepner, the guy who knocked down Muhammad Ali and the inspiration for Rocky. Uh, a guy named Ken Buchanan from Scotland. Fought Roberto Duran for the lightweight, lightweight title at the Garden. And as Roberto Duran himself, hands of stone. A little heavier these days, but um, still, you could see his hands made of stone. Emil Griffith, great boxer in the 60s and 70s. He passed away. Um, this is a, a guy, uh, just a, a club fighter that uh, I think he's a security guard now. Uh, Carmen Basilio, great, great fighter in the 50s. Jake LaMotta, the Raging Bull. He's still alive today and he's like 90 something years old. Uh, some other stuff that I've done around uh, the US Open tennis, the young Venus Williams. Um, there's a position at the Open where you can go behind the, the service line and you try and just again working with light. Uh, Serena is so great to photograph. She's just goes through the gamut of, of emotions during a match. And um, uh, regardless what you may think of any of these athletes as, a, as people, uh, to photograph them as athletes, is she is probably the best tennis player to photograph. Um, there's all kinds of hairstyles you wanna you know, pay attention to. Angles at the US Open, you can get one position overhead and really work on it. Uh, you can get right on top of the player. Um, this player just happened to throw a ball up a certain time of day and I just kept noticing the ball shadow crossing his face. And I kept working on it and working on it and working on it and working on it. And it would, the shadow would be here, the shadow would be there, the shadow would be gone. I missed the ball, it was out of focus. You know. But one came in and I, I got this one right between his eyes. Um, late day sun on center court. It won't be like this again because they're putting the roof on. But I was glad to have the opportunity to be able to shoot this kind of picture because I'll, I'll know soon next week, but I don't think this will happen again, this kind of picture uh, where the late day sun can shine like this. Uh, lucky enough to be in Andre's last match, Andre Agassi. Or oh, watch Nadal win the US Open. Rafael Nadal, one of the greatest players today. Uh, I was lucky enough to go to Wimbledon last year and uh, got to see two greats play, Novak Djokovic against Roger Federer. Uh, and again, to see Nadal dive around the court, he's just throws caution to the wind when he plays. He's great to see. Uh, I squeezed in an infrared camera along the way just to do this scene. Uh, the thing about Wimbledon is it's like no other place. There's no advertising. The seats come right down to the ground. And if you go to any tennis court in America or overseas now, there's signs everywhere. There's all kinds of crap. Wimbledon keeps it the way it was from 100 years ago. And it's beautiful. It's, even if you go on vacation, uh, there's just some place to go see a tennis match. Um, uh, you know, again, you, backgrounds are key when you're shooting tennis. Um, little moments in time, you know, you want to throw the background out. I'm shooting, I think, 1.2, just to throw out the background. Uh, upstairs, overhead, nothing wrong with shooting tennis overhead, right time of day. Uh, this is just a cycling race I did many years ago but kind of helped me along in my career. It helped get my name out there early on. It's early 90s, I think I shot this. Um, but they stopped the train on the track and I just wanted to convey speed. You know, these guys are in a hurry, they gotta beat the train. Um, so while you think I'm on the track, while the train's coming, the, the train was long stopped by the police and everybody got off the track and let the riders go by. Uh, same race, I just found an old barn and you just kind of work composition, the rule of thirds. Some pictures I did of Michael Phelps uh, years ago. Uh, I was able to do some stuff of him underwater with the reflection. This was after he won all his medals at the Beijing Olympics. We were able to, to get exclusive on the, on the photo shoot. Evander Holyfield younger when he was early in his career at his house in Atlanta. Um, this is during spring training. Um, this is on a plexiglass sheet clear plexiglass, I put it on two saw horses, and I was underneath the girl and I had her on top, uh, on top of the plexiglass. Uh, uh, she's a sprinter, her name's Allison Felix, gold medalist. This is her in the studio later that day. We did a slow, slow speed uh, flash blur. Donovan McNair at his house, he's got an indoor pool. Again, water, you know, just makes, adds a different dimension. I had him jumping out of the water about 20 times. Uh, this is an old boxer named Joe Frazier, and it was a real pleasure to, to get to photograph him before he passed away. 
uh, champion to the end. Uh, these are, you know, I don't know if you'll see these days again, but these are three great players for the Yankees, uh, Ore Posada, um, Derek Jeter, and, and uh, Mariano Rivera. Uh, this is a scene that we'll never see again. This is the World Trade Center back in the 90s when things were, things were the way they were. And uh, I always look at this picture and just think how innocent this was for me to be walking up and down the west side and just saw a scene. I thought it was nice, you know. A year later, we know what happened. Um, I went into the roof of the Coliseum and I wanted to shoot bull riding because they'd always fall off. I just thought from the floor it wouldn't look as good as, as it did from up here and I set up a strobe and was able to create a shadow with the strobe, artificial lighting. And can I break the picture up into dimensions? And the cowboy just happened to fall the right way. Uh, it's hard to do this now because a lot of them wear like these face mask helmets. Um, so it doesn't look as cool. Uh, foggy day at old Foxborough Stadium. Halloween, just taking advantage of what's in front of me. Ray Lewis, pure ball of energy. Great to photograph his entrance. Uh, late day at, at, at the old Meadowland Stadium on top of the roof. Uh, little pieces of light dancing on the stadium again. Uh, I don't really like shooting there on the field uh, or at least up and down the sidelines. So I just try and look for different things. This was at Foxborough. This is during the Super Bowl. This is when um, James Harrison ran back a 99 yard interception for a touchdown. Now, uh, the Cardinals were going the other way. They were on the one, way back on the other side. And my, my job that day was to be in this end zone. But I wasn't, uh, I wasn't uh, not paying attention. I was concentrating. And uh, again, it was one of those things where you just get yourself ready for anything. And sure as heck, the guy ran back, 99 defensive lineman, ran it all the way back, and it turned the tide of the game. It was a big play. Um, slow speed entrance, Super Bowl win. Uh, even a guy as uh, Robert Griffin III is when he kind of tore up his knee and his career hasn't been the same since. But it's plays like that where I had a, I had a feeling, you know, he was getting beat up during the game and I kind of positioned myself behind the line of scrimmage and thought they're working on him and I don't think he's going to make it much longer. And uh, not, not soon after that, and I'm, I'm no prophet, I've been wrong many more times than I've been right, but this one time I was right, he tore his knee up at that particular moment. Um, you can't get this at Yankee Stadium anymore because um, they, block off this, they block off this New York Yankees sign. Uh, and it was also the days when, years ago, when we were another company, we weren't able to get onto the field for the game, uh, credentials. So I was able to do this from the stands. So. Uh, <clears throat> Moral of the story is to not ever be discouraged. There's always a picture somewhere. Uh, this is when Derek broke his ankle. Just be, gotta be ready for stuff like that. Uh, set up a remote for the end of the World Series. This is when the Red Sox won after all those years of not winning. Uh, or a remote for when Mariano's last game was. Uh, again, I was on the field, but I was firing this while I was on the field shooting him. Um, you know, be ready for anything. The guy flipped over on a home run. I think it was a grand slam home run. Uh, again, not on the field, home run, just from old Yankee Stadium and left field. Just wanted to try something different. I just hung out there a few innings and the guy hit a home run and everybody went crazy. Uh, again, I'm a sucker for sunsets. This was this season and it just happened to really be a nice sunset. Uh, or during the US Open, I just noticed this kid doing skateboarding uh, right outside the stadium. Took advantage of it. Uh, remote inside the net. I'm um, by, no, by, by no means, I'm no expert at doing goal cam remotes, but this was a special one. Martin Brodeur broke the all-time goalie wins record, and the camera got knocked in the third period, so it was facing this way. And I thought I was sunk, but it actually worked out to break up the picture nicely. Happy accident. Um, late day light on tennis player. Uh, set up one strobe for a basketball game, just to get some shadows in there, a little detail. UFC event. Um, Basketball overhead remote. Basketball to me is, it's again one of those sports that's just so hard to get a good picture. You know, you tend to rely on remotes a lot. Uh, this was a bored Ranger fan during a game. I don't know, the kid got great seats. I don't know what his problem is, but uh, you know, he just happened to be next to me, you know, take advantage of what's in front of you. Um, outdoor game, Yankee Stadium. Oh, I set up a GoPro on my old college football team. Uh, they let me shoot the spring game. 
So I put the GoPros on the helmet and just let the thing run. And, you know, it just ran while play was going on. There's the quarterback with the thing on. So it's during live hitting and everything. And so I was able to get an angle that, you know, you don't usually see. But uh, I just thought it was cool to try that. Uh, again, quiet moment away from the photographers during Derek Jeter's last game, uh, last season. This is the first game of the year. And I positioned myself away from everyone else. We were all waiting for him to go outside. I kind of was just waiting at the bottom of the steps. And it was an eye contact thing with, with, the, uh, with the PR guy, and he let me stay there. And it worked out. Um, he would always lead his team onto the field, so I wanted to just get that, pop the flash off camera as he led the team out. And he just was so humble. Humble. It was just so, such a pleasure being able to follow him his whole career. Um, There's a local event here in Central Park, horse, horse jumping at twilight. Uh, this was an event not too long ago at Times Square. Just took advantage of all the signage. Well, once signage works in my life, I was able to work it out. Uh, Belmont is a special place for me. I've been going, and I really like to do the training, is what gets me more excited. Get there really early and shoot the sunrises and the nice light and it's a beautiful trail leading onto the, the race course. You know, I kind of like to walk around and see what I could see. I like to go upstairs and um, go by the barns and shoot all kinds of stuff. This is American Pharaoh this year. It's just a uh, quiet moment uh, amidst hundreds of cameras. And I just, I, I saw him do it once and I missed it. And so I positioned myself and waited for this one moment. I laid on the floor really low because there was a bunch of TV cameras below this, which is why it's cropped the way it is. But I needed it clean in order for this picture to work. I've seen versions of this, you know, with the barn in the background, and I, I needed it cleaner. Uh, remote on the starting gate, Farrow starting the race, and then he killed the, he killed the field. And uh, it was a real pleasure to see that this year. So um, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. And if there's any questions, I'm, I'm here. Uh, if you want to ask me anything or... Whatever you need. So thank you for coming. I really appreciate it.